The undisputed greatest big three in the history of basketball have a certain stage presence that can't be taught. The four-time world champions can flip a switch to activate kill mode, and that's exactly what they did down the stretch to throw an overhand right for the Game 5 knockout blow against the Sacramento Kings. Steph sealed it by dribbling through the entire Sacktown team by displaying his all-time underrated handle, leading to a dramatic and one. His fellow all-time shooter and clutch player in Clay Thompson, in addition to the product of Kansas and Joel Embiid's former college teammate and number one overall 2014 draft pick, A. Wiggins, hit timely daggers all throughout this one, but specifically down the stretch. However, star of the show was Draymond Green, or as Kerr called him, Draymond Nowitzki, posting his highest personal point total in a game since Christmas Day in 2019. Jordan Poole replacing Draymond in the starting five has become quite the storyline considering what these two have been through this year, including a reported second altercation between the two of them around this year's All-Star break. Green being up front with Steve Kerr and moving to the bench in replace of Poole is a beautiful narrative which displays the selflessness from Green and the spacing offensively provided by JP. Draymond was great defensively in this one like he always is, but while Draymond's usually the defensive star, he and Poole switched roles in Game 5, as while Green was knocking down clutch triples, it was conversely Jordan making the effort stances on the other end, who as you'll find out, is making blasphemous hate seem naive. You can't forget the winners of Game 5 historically have an 85% chance to win a series. Stay tuned to see how the generational intellect of the dub's playsets and personnel showed up to the moment and maybe had their greatest performance as a unit in this second era of the dynasty of all time. I, I, I mean, I, Jordan Poole, I have no hope for him. Um, he, I, he's not a good basketball player, and at this point he's <laughs> getting benched in the second half for good reason. If you think Jordan Poole's a great player, just you don't know basketball. He is so bad defensively. By the way, have you seen Jordan Poole? Like, are you comfortable with that guy's contract as a one-way, at best, a one-way player who can only play offense at best? He's arguably, he's, he's definitely one of the worst defensive guards in the league. Those recent takes you just saw from talking heads from several different networks were uncalled for given Jordan Poole averaged 13 plus points per game off the bench back in 2022's NBA Finals on just under 60% true shooting. Sure, JP's had his inconsistencies this season, making several costly turnovers in close games and not shooting the ball exceptionally well this year. However, lest you forget, the just 23-year-old averaged over 20 points per game this year for the first time in his four-year career on a very decent 43-34-87 shooting split. In response to those blasphemous takes filled with recency bias that you just saw from those talking heads, Jordan has responded by averaging 16 points and two steals from games three through five of this series. Regardless of the numbers though, bottom line is, the 2022 NBA Finals proved Jordan Poole is a champion, plain and simple. The fact that he averaged over 20 points per game this season, yet has received not merely little respect, but also hate, is pure blasphemy, and it's your average toxic, non-internally accepted jealousy that must be dismissed, which is why we're spending so much time away from the court in today's episode. Despite, as you saw some guy on the Bill Simmons podcast labeling him as at best a one-way player and one of the worst defensive guards in basketball, not only did Poole rack up a steal where after a Stephen Curry turnover, he turns on the Jets, doesn't give up on the play, and flies back to knock it off Sabonis, man had steals on consecutive possessions in quarter number three, after GP2 fumbles Draymond's pass, JP saves two points for the Warriors by knocking it away from Sabonis to stop the fast break. Very next possession, quote unquote, one of the worst defensive guards in the league knocks it away from Sabonis, leading to a fast break where he finds Stephen Curry for the lay-in. Meanwhile, this team's enforcer Draymond Green traded places with Jordan for this night in particular, as despite dealing with beef with Tony Brothers, which we'll talk about later on, where he got smacked in the face but there was nothing called, Green was knocking down triples like Poole, just like Poole was defending like Green. Quickly from a King's perspective, your two top guys in Fox and Sabonis are both battling through hand injuries that 
would have ended almost any other player's season. Let's give them some credit for fighting through those setbacks. With that said though, if you're going to be out there, I think you got to have a sense of urgency and togetherness. They haven't displayed that whatsoever in these last couple games. Conversely, the Warriors have that very togetherness, and then some, as the personality mesh of Draymond and Jordan is exactly what any given team needs to try and find in terms of the players who are amidst the top six most important guys on their roster. Both the toughness of Draymond and vibe enhancement of Jordan each have a make-or-break impact. At the same time, while they're similar in that respect, their two different approaches to the game have proven to clash with one another as well. Many don't consider Jordan as a valuable piece to the puzzle because the team stacked up with the likes of Steph, Dre, Clay, and Wiggs, but people forget without Jordan, this team's energy can't reach its maximum potential. Meanwhile, this relates to Green because while people claim he's washed, the Warriors' toughness can't reach its full potential without Draymond. Going back to Green, and he was making his layups, as he made a point of not making on his podcast before Game 5, he made a back-breaking triple, which was one of the biggest buckets of the night, ultimately finishing with a monster stat line of 21-7-4-4 four, four on 80% shooting from the field. They needed to win either Game 5 or 7 on the road, but after Green treated Game 5 like a must-win, respectably putting everything out there on the line, it seems as if a Game 7 won't even be necessary to take care of the Kings. Draymond's the hard-nosed anchor, while Poole is the laid-back energy bringer, and they're both versatile to act as either one of those things on any given night. Having too many of either one of those two types of personalities will disturb any given team's chemistry, while having one or two of each, which is what the Warriors have, is a recipe for success. This allows the Dubs personnel to respect the message of Steve Kerr at all costs, aka buy into the system. Combine that with the fact that Kerr is an all-time head coach with a creative and adaptable playbook, and this leads the Warriors to consistently execute like champions and display top-notch versatility, which has allowed them to rack up all of the winning experiences that they have, experience which they rely upon. Regarding the focus and toughness of this Warriors team, I wanted to give a shout out to the Warriors old coach, now famous ESPN analyst Mark Jackson, who was the Doug Collins to Steve Kerr's Phil Jackson, as without the mentorship of Mark, who instilled toughness in these dubs early in their careers, Kerr wouldn't have been able to keep them focused enough to master his offensive system. But for any dynasty to even be considered one in the first place, a winning organization needs a high character utterly gifted number one option. Without Wardell Stephen Curry II, this warrior organization doesn't come close to reaching the prestigious level that it has. Then there's the impact of any given team's fan base. No matter where they are across the world, no matter which state or country, whether they're in the Bay Area or not, a team can truly go only as far as the support of their fan base. Whether you're a YouTube commenter or creator, a spamming Twitter troll, etc. Where your support and dedication is coming from means everything. Whether said support is coming from a place of greed or hate, or if it's coming from a place of love and betterment, has a lot to do with the success of any team. The greatest face of the franchise in any sport of all time, as put by President Bob Myers early in the year, evidently knows the value of his home crowd. Oh yeah. Make sure y'all get y'all butts in the seats at 5 o'clock, tip off. Uh, it's a little early, but everybody get off of work early in the Bay. Let's go. The reacquisition of Gary Payton II at the deadline in a three-team deal where James Wiseman ended up on the Pistons after the Warriors initially lost GP2 in free agency to Portland last summer continues to pay dividends. GP2 may have been 13 below Draymond as a plus zero on the score sheet in terms of his plus minus, but Gary made valuable hustle plays and was the second most important bench piece behind Draymond by far. He grabbed some clutch offensive boards and had eight points. Meanwhile, starting five-man Kevon Looney is one of three players of all time next to Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell to have a playoff game with 20 boards, five dimes, and under five points. He has three of them, while Wilt and Bill Russell each have one. 
But let's look at how the Warriors manufactured their clutchest buckets of the night. The under-talked about Andrew Wiggins was coming through when it mattered most, as out of this five-out backdoor cut action with the center and Looney cutting to the hoop, that collapses the defense and Green racks up one of his seven dimes on the night by kicking it to Andrew in the corner. This weak side inverted pick and pop with Steph setting the on ball gets Wiggins the iso where he puts together a hezzy cross and momentum cross to explode into a slight drive entry before nastily spinning back to create space for the fallaway jumper. Elite footwork from the former Kansas Jayhawk. Earlier, Clay would find his flow as watch him just cross half court and pull up for the contested triple. Maybe back when Barnes was pals with Green and on the Warriors at that point in time, this type of three-point defense would be acceptable, but despite Harrison being beyond the three-point line in his coverage, Clay's range is evidently generational. This Chinget SOB sees the inbounder, in this case Clay, receive it back from Dre, while Thompson gets a handoff screen from Green. Red Velvet navigates the screen perfectly, but somehow Clay knocks down the off-balance triple after one bounce. Very next offensive possession, he's got to put it up at the end of the shot clock and crosses back to pull up from 40 for the bailout heave. Then he gets to his spot behind the arc off a simple five out pick and roll with Green where he drifts in for the off balanced bomb in traffic. Biggest play of any for Clay though, on a night where he had a 25 piece with five threes, came during the clutch where out of this Chicago action, he first gets a flare from Draymond, then after handing it off, Loon sets the big body as well. But the best player down the stretch was the best player in franchise history. First bit of clutchness with the dubs up four early in the fourth, sees him get the switch off the fast-footed Fox and onto the less quick Keegan Murray, who he's gonna sauce up with a moving between the legs cross right, a moving behind the back left, a momentum cross into a fake step back before using elusive body language to keep Murray guessing on his drive in the midst of blowing right past the rookie. Another youngin's draped all over him right here, but Curry's gonna hit, in this case, Mitchell with a nasty Smitty dribble to open up the weak side before he attacks downhill and hits the contested floater. Wiggins is going to be in the same spot GP2 was just in, getting Steph the weak side switch onto Murray, who Steph goes full 2K mode on, going between the legs cross directly into a curry slide, and his speed takes over from there. Play of the night from anyone, however, displays a mix of Steph's speed, shiftiness, ability to shift gears, and change direction all at once. Doubled and seemingly trapped by Domas and Barnes, Steph craftily fakes the layup on Barnes to get him jumping, weaves through the sandwich of Barnes and Murray, fakes another loop around Monk to freeze every Kings player before relentlessly exploding to his strong hand for the and one. Pure craftiness, pure domination, purely clutch on a bucket which ultimately sealed game five and dramatically threw an overhand right followed by a punch to the stomach on the Sacramento faithful in a hostile environment on the road. You expected the refs to be against the dubs in this one given it was a road game and the dubs don't get many calls in the first place, but this shockingly turned into not only a battle between the Warriors and Kings, but the dubs and the officials. Malik Monk got the better end of the stick three times when the call shouldn't have gone his way in obvious fashion. First, he rammed into Curry like he was a bull being released in a rodeo sport, and it wasn't a flagrant one or two. Then Monk flopped back into Andrew Wiggins and got the benefit of the doubt. Monk would also smack Draymond Green in the face on the fast break, but it not only wasn't even reviewed for a flagrant one or two, but it wasn't even a common foul. On that play, if the roles were reversed, with the NBA's becoming more and more obvious Draymond rules, we know what would have happened to him. It would have been an ejection, or at the very least, a flagrant one. Instead, no whistle at all. Very interesting indeed. Approaching a closeout game at home, the Warriors and Kings NorCal Thriller could be put to bed in Game 6, as the legendary four-time champions have the opportunity to clinch yet another series win. With a 31-piece from Stephen Curry, he continued to cement his legacy as the greatest player in Warriors history. In terms of the other man to be in the conversation for that, Steph joined the late great Wilt Chamberlain as the only other players in franchise history to score at least 28 
in the first five games of a playoff run. Meanwhile, overall, as a 15-man unit and coaching staff, every bit of turbulence this team has been through this year, whether between Draymond and Poole, finishing as the sixth seed in the West, being a horror awful team on the road during the regular season, the absence of Andrew Wiggins, unrightfully cutting Mac McClung in my opinion, and even more tough narratives to deal with outside of that, it's starting to seem like nothing will stop the 2023 Golden State Warriors.